I think I shall start on time. It's eight o'clock. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Hao Kwan, Division Hematology Oncology. Uh, it's my privilege this morning to introduce our speaker. You know, as a hematologist, you encounter hemolysis quite often. And during that time, since there's so many etiology for hemolysis, uh, your best support comes from the blood bank. So, so we're, without that, uh, it will be a hard time for us to deal with it clinically. So we had Dr. Lindum here this morning. Uh, Dr. Lindum got his MD uh, in M Minneapolis in 1988, where he, after he got that, he did his pathology residency. And from there, he went to NCI and was doing molecular biology uh, until 1984, at which time he then went, joined the uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. There he undertook further training, but this time in blood banking. And he stayed there until uh, 2002, where we are fortunate to have him join Northwestern. Uh, in addition to blood banking, I had to say that he's an expert in hemostasis and bleeding and uh, thrombotic uh, disorders. Uh, currently, he is associate professor in pathology at Northwestern, and he is the medical director of the hemostasis uh, lab. Uh, in addition, he's the co-medical director of our blood bank. So without further ado, here is Dr. Lindum. Thank you, Dr. Kwan, for that very nice introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, very good. I'll uh, try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Very good. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to the Lurie Cancer Center Virtual Grand Rounds. Uh, today I would like to uh, talk with you uh, about a topic of practical importance for uh, uh, those of us who uh, use uh, blood transfusion as a life-saving treatment. Uh, and I'd in particular like to talk about hemolytic transfusion reactions, how we recognize them, uh, treat them, and what we can do to uh, try to uh, prevent them. And uh, my talk <coughs> will be organized uh, in uh, three basic parts. The, uh, First part, I'll give some introductory comments. And then uh, after that, I will talk uh, in the second section, session, section uh, on uh, the uh, uh, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. And then finally, I'll give a case uh, illustration of an acute hemolytic reaction and uh, what we can do to uh, treat that and avoid uh, having that happen. Uh, so I'll move on to my next slide. Uh, I do not have any financial disclosures for this presentation this morning. Uh, and here are my objectives. Uh, we'd like to talk about uh, how to recognize uh, using uh, laboratory and clinical findings, a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, and how we can use the especially the laboratory findings to help us prevent a future transfusion reaction. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about acute hemolytic transfusion reactions and uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, treat those. And uh, uh, I'd like to also uh, have you uh, learn uh, a little bit about the correct patient identification procedures that we use to prevent a mistransfusion or a transfusion of blood unintended for the recipient. Uh, 
this slide uh, sh uh, table shows uh, uh, the uh, transfusion reaction breakdown at NMH Hospital Blood Bank uh, for the years of 2015 to 2017 and for 2018 to 2019. And uh, you can see on the bottom overall, uh, the rate of transfusion reactions is about approximately 0.45% and it's been stable uh, over uh, the, uh, this uh, five years. And uh, uh, if you look uh, at it, uh, uh, there are just a couple of points I want to make from this. Uh, the first is, is that allergic and febrile reactions, of course, are the most common type of reaction that we're going to occur with, that we're going to encounter with transfusion, with transfusions. But uh, there are other more serious and, and more uh, un, uh, rare events. Fortunately, hemolytic reactions are fairly uh, rare, but uh, we do encounter them uh, periodically. And you'll see uh, if you compare the uh, two time periods that the delayed hemolytic reaction, we only had one in 2015 to 2017, but we had uh, uh, 11 uh, in 2018 and 2019, which is quite a difference. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, we uh, in the blood bank implemented a policy to uh, when we get a positive direct antiglobulin test and new antibodies, uh, we've, uh, uh, we work those up and report them as transfusion reactions. They may not have been detected clinically. And in fact, uh, often that's one of the things I'd like to leave you with today is that delayed hemolytic reactions may uh, only be detected uh, in the blood bank and may not uh, really uh, come to clinical notice. But that's not true in all cases, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. Hemolytic transfusion reactions uh, uh, have been reported in large hemovigilance programs, uh, and uh, this gives their approximate uh, incidents, uh, both for delayed and acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. You can see that uh, for delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, they occur between approximately 1.6 and 7.9 uh, per 100,000 in European and Canadian studies, and that acute hemolytic transfusion reactions are about half as common. These may be uh, somewhat underreported numbers because, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, these uh, sometimes are difficult to recognize, especially the delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. The United States uh, Food and Drug Administration, administration requires uh, all blood banks to report uh, fatal transfusion reactions. And this uh, little graph here shows uh, what the uh, a number of uh, fatal hemolytic reactions were over the time period from 2005 to 2016. You can see that it's uh, pretty uh, significantly dropped off in the last uh, few years, although it's uh, uh, leveled off perhaps since 2010. Uh, and that, um, you can see that uh, there are a variety of different causes, but one that remains and one that hasn't changed much is the ABO incompatible transfusion, uh, hemolytic transfusion reactions. They occur at about uh, five, uh, approximately five uh, per year in the United States and they occur about one to one and a half to one to two million uh, transfusions. So it gives you a little idea. Uh, these are often catastrophic and uh, lead to uh, fatal outcomes. So uh, uh, acute hemolytic reactions are definitely something that we want to try to avoid. This table uh, shows uh, a list of all of the different kinds of things that can lead to an acute hemolytic or acute or delayed hemolytic reaction. 
Uh, they can include immune and non-immune uh, reactions, as well as things that can uh, be exacerbated by hemolytic reactions. And uh, it is important to consider sometimes uh, the possible contribution of mechanical and uh, non-immune causes, especially when immune causes are not found. Uh, so as such things as uh, was the uh, blood bag uh, improperly heated uh, or was there osmotic lysis from an infusion solution or was there mechanical injury from infusing the blood through a small needle under high pressure. So these things occasionally occur, but the ones that we're gonna focus on today are the uh, delayed hemolytic uh, transfusion reactions uh, and also uh, acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. So these ones up in the top of the table here. So the first uh, case that I'd like to show you uh, illustrates uh, how a case could present uh, uh, in your clinic. Uh, uh, a patient uh, is a 76 year old female who uh, had a history of atrial fibrillation and she was treated with a pixaban and amiodarone. And uh, she has a, a laminecti lam laminectomy spinal surgery. And uh, she had no previous transfusion uh, history uh, that uh, the blood bank could ascertain. And uh, she had a negative antibody screen. So uh, the blood bank set up a couple of units and sent them to the operating room. and. Uh, uh, so she received those units uh, during the uh, procedure uh, and uh, then she recovered well and went home and then returned to the clinic with generalized weakness fatigue and uh, she noticed for a day or two that her urine was very uh, dark, uh, co almost coffee-like. And uh, this uh, slide shows a, a, a little uh, time course of her hemoglobin and bilirubin. Uh, you can see that uh, she got those two units on uh, January 11th. Uh, her hemoglobin at the time was 7.4. Uh, at the time of discharge, uh, the hemoglobin was 9.2 and her bilirubin uh, looked normal. Uh, when she returned, uh, she was found to have a hemoglobin of 8.9 and a bilirubin total of 2.1 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, the blood bank discovered that she had a new uh, antibody, anti-E and anti-KID-A. And uh, not only that, but they also found that the direct antiglobulin test was positive for IgG. And uh, uh, what they did then was they eluded the antibody off of the red blood cells to study that as well. And they found out that the RBC alloyate contained anti-KID-8. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, that her hemoglobin actually dropped to 6.3. And uh, in retrospect, we uh, reviewed, uh, we were able to type the uh, units that she received and found out that uh, two of them had the, both of them had the KID A antigen, and one of them had the E antigen. And uh, so uh, we discovered that she probably had a delayed hemolytic reaction on the basis of these laboratory findings. And then she was transfused with uh, two units then of uh, a blood that were negative for big E and KID A antigen. And her hemoglobin came back up. And uh, it was noted on that, on that day, the 25th of January, that her, she had a very low haptoglobin and an elevated LDH. Uh, but after that, uh, the patient uh, recovered. And uh, so I'll, I'll show that in a minute here. But uh, first, I'm going to just review the direct antiglobulin test. So the, the direct antiglobulin test basically uses this reagent called the Coombs reagent. And what this is, is an antibody uh, or antibodies that recognize uh, human IgG and human complement fragments. And uh, so uh, if you add this reagent to cells that are sensitized with antibody 
then the cells uh, and the antibodies agglutinate and form the agglutination reaction that you see on the on the right, which would be recorded as a positive direct antiglobulin test. On the other hand, if the uh, red cells are not uh, sensitized with antibody or complement, then when you add the Coombs reagent, there's no reaction and the uh, cells stay in a nice suspension. This test can detect as few as 100 to 500 molecules of IgG or complement on the red blood cells. So it's pretty sensitive. However, uh, it turns out that you don't need that many antibodies on red blood cells to potentially cause lysis. So occasionally you can have uh, very small amounts of antibody or complement on the red blood cells, which can uh, be a problem for uh, hemolysis that are not detected by the direct antiglobulin test. And that's why sometimes our colleagues will order something called the super Coombs or the micro Coombs, uh, which are higher sensitivity methods that can detect even fewer antibodies uh, on the cells. This slide shows the time course for our first patient. And you can see that uh, on the, uh, she had at the time of discharge, she had a hemoglobin of 9.2 normal bilirubin. Uh, but then uh, upon uh, return to the clinic and hospital, she was found to be, have a hemoglobin of 6.4 and a, a bilirubin of 2.1. Uh, so basically, after she got that transfusion, she recovered and her hemoglobin was essentially normal after that. She did have a little drop in her hemoglobin later uh, because of a uh, knee uh, arthroplasty, uh, but uh, she recovered without transfusion there. So this patient had a you know, significant appearance of uh, anemia and hemolysis uh, that uh, you know, occurred a few days in this case, about 11 days after the transfusion uh, and uh, was uh, first seen in the clinic. And the uh, typical, the sort of prototypic time course for extravascular hemolysis and delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction is like this. They tend to occur about seven to 10 days after the transfusion with a drop in hemoglobin and an increase uh, especially in the uh, bilirubin and, and indirect bilirubin. Our patient may have had a slightly delayed course. And the, uh, the, uh, the time course of this can uh, depend on different things, like whether there was prior alloa immunization, which antibodies were involved, and a lot of other variables. In the delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, IgG and complement can sensitize the cells, although the complement that's on the cells uh, tends to not go beyond the C3B stage, so that you tend to just get opsonization of the red cells. The cells then, when they go through the reticuloendothelial system, uh, can be uh, started, they can, uh, the, the uh, macrophages can take little nibbles out of them in a stepwise manner, and they can uh, process that he, uh, hemoglobin into heme and then iron, and, and uh, those things then are uh, dealt with by the uh, body. But there generally is not much heme that's re uh, uh, or iron that's released into the vascular system. Uh, and so they tend not to have a real dramatic clinical course with the exception of uh, in sickle cell disease, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, you can see anemia, hemolysis, and uh, microsphere cytosis. This slide uh, shows uh, a uh, distribution of some of the different antigens that are involved in the types of transfusion reactions that we're talking about this morning. And uh, for, uh, the thing that I want to point out is that with delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, it's usually an amnestic response, uh, usually to uh, a prior exposure to blood. Now that could be exposure to blood through a transfusion or transfusions, 
or it could be through pregnancy. And uh, the rate of alloimmunization in uh, blood transfusion uh, in persons who are chronically transfused is approximately 3%. Uh, in pregnancy, uh, the uh, incidence seems to be closer to about 1%. So it's low, uh, but definitely if your patient has had a history of pregnancy in the past, uh, and they get another unit of blood, that is something to, con to uh, consider is that they could have a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. The antigens uh, that they can have antibodies to vary somewhat with the population, uh, but for, uh, for the most part, uh, the most common ones are gonna be the RH antigens, D, C, and E, and uh, sometimes Kel, sometimes Duffy, uh, sometimes Kid. Those are going to be the most common ones, once in a while, sometimes an S. Uh, and these tend to be IgGs uh, that, uh, you know, fix complement poorly or, or uh, maybe uh, don't activate complement all the way. On the other hand, uh, intravascular hemolysis, which we'll get to a little bit later, uh, does have, uh, uh, tends to occur with IgM antibodies, that can bind to uh, various antigens. The most common would be the ABO, and uh, those are efficient at fixing complement, and those can cause the uh, dramatic intravascular hemolysis. So this uh, little flow sheet comes out of the New England Journal, kind of is a nice summary. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, little points here, but uh, I think we've already kind of uh, looked at that in our case, and we'll look at another case in a moment here. And uh, the, the basic point is that from the blood bank angle, what we're going to do is we're going to find out what those antibodies are and provide antigen negative blood going forward. Here's another case. Uh, it's of a 53-year-old man uh, who had a history of iron deficiency anemia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And uh, he presented with a one week history of fatigue, weakness, dizziness, and anemia. And he received two units of red cells at an outside hospital. He stayed there for four days and then went home. He then fainted at home and presented at another hospital and stayed for seven days. And he received seven units of red cells as along with uh, st treatment with steroids and IVIG. And then uh, he was actually transferred to NMH for escalation of care because he continued to have fatigue, dizziness, shortness of breath, and chest pain and confusion. So he uh, was pretty ill. And uh, you can see that his hemoglobin was 5.4, his LDH was elevated, and his bilirubin was quite high. Uh, with uh, mostly indirect bilirubin. He was treated with uh, methylprednisolone and cyclosporin, and uh, he received during his uh, admission 17 red cells and uh, 13 sessions of plasma exchange. Now, this was his presenting uh, blood smear, and the blood smear, uh, it says that it shows uh, micro, uh, microspherocyte spherocytes, uh, but also uh, that's a little difficult, I think, to, to uh, recognize on, on this uh, picture. But uh, definitely, uh, you, can, uh, you don't have to look at it for very long to see that there's definitely an agglutination problem here. And this can occur with cold autoantibodies. Uh, so in the blood bank, uh, here's what his workup looked like. This is a blood bank workup sheet that uh, I just uh, took a, a, a snapshot of. And uh, you can see a, a couple things I'll point out here. Uh, in his forward type, uh, that is what antigens are on his red cells, we got a, uh, a negative reaction with anti-A and a positive, weak positive with anti-B. Um, but he's not, a, he's not a group B person. And that's a very atypical reaction for, you know, to have a weak in the forward type like that. So uh, it actually turns out that this was a cold autoantibody that was interfering with this because uh, they were able to uh, get this reaction to go to zero uh, just by simply warming the sample up. 
the reverse type confirms that he was a group O because he has both anti-A and anti-B in his plasma, and he's Rh positive. You can see his antibody screen was positive with all the cells, so we're not really able to make an, an antibody ID. And they did a treatment here with DTT, which is a reducing agent, which would preferentially break down IgG in our system. So uh, the fact that we have a reaction with all cells and then also with DTT just tells us that tells us that this is most likely an IgG type antibody here. And then on his direct Coombs test, uh, he did have a positive direct Coombs test. We use a polyspecific Coombs reagent, which reacts with both antibody and complement. It was positive. But then when we fractionated, we saw that there were no reactions with IgG, but there were reactions with complements. So it looks like most of the sensitization of his red cells were with complement. And then uh, the auto control was positive. So this uh, prompted them to also then do an elution of the uh, red, red blood cells. They basically treat the red cells with an acid buffer. They get the antibodies off, they concentrate them and uh, buffer them back to neutral pH and then test them in an antibody screen. And you can see that there, there's basically a broad positivity here. There's not much specificity. There's a couple of reactions that are a little weaker here, but they don't indicate a specific uh, reaction. So this is basically the pattern of a warm autoantibody that apparently is somewhat weak because the DAT was weak and the auto control was only one plus. But there is probably a warm autoantibody here. And then we also know that, that his antibody screen was positive. I did, I'm not showing that. But what I will show you is that we did a thermal amplitude study. And with a thermal amplitude study, what we're basically doing, uh, we get a, a sample that's collected warm and, and we separate the plasma from the cells before they cool off so that we can get an accurate indication of how strong any cold autoantibodies would be. Then we react those uh, serum with uh, different uh, cells uh, at different temperatures. And uh, you can see the whole panel of reactions here. In fact, what you can see at a glance is that everything was reactive, even at 30 degrees and 37 degrees. And uh, that indicates that probably uh, this uh, is a clinically significant antibody. That along with the fact that uh, he had complement on his cells. So the fact that he had complement and these positive reactions, that really uh, tells us that there's a clinically significant cold autoantibody probably in here. Um, but then uh, three days later, we did another antibody screen. This time his uh, uh, direct antiglobulin test was also positive, but we detected IgG on the cells as well. And uh, so they repeated the elution and they got this pattern. Now on this uh, uh, panel, I'm not gonna go through with everyone how to read uh, panels here, uh, but uh, to cut a long story short, uh, basically what this is showing, it is showing some specificity because we have some negative reactions and some positives. And we're seeing that there's now reaction with antigens E and kid A. And uh, so these are new antibodies that are detected in the alloid. And this tells us that there's antibodies on the red cells that are reacting with both the E and the kid A antigen. And uh, so these are uh, unexpected and, and uh, probably indicate that there is some type of a uh, either delayed serologic or delayed hemolytic uh, reaction. Uh, so in addition to his warm and cold autoantibodies, he now looks like he uh, has anti-E and anti-KID-A on the cells. Why the warm autoantibody isn't showing up here is not entirely clear to me. It might be because he was getting treated with cyclosporin and uh, methylprednisolone. This is the time course of this patient's treatment, and we're Right now, we're just down in this area here. We're looking at these first few days, and you can see that despite 
a lot of transfusion and a lot of plasma exchange. This patient's hemoglobin never really got above about 8.5 uh, and uh, he kept dropping uh, down again. So he was having a pretty refractory course to his treatment. And uh, then uh, uh, you can also see that his bilirubin remained pretty high. Uh, but then uh, what happened was that they discovered, uh, the team discovered on his workup that they did a, um, a CT scan and a PET scan. This is the PET scan, I think. Uh, the CT scan showed that his spleen had a three centimeter uh, mass and the PET scan showed a hypermetabolic uh, little uh, signal there uh, on the anterior and inferior spleen. So uh, the next day he got a splenectomy and uh, uh, the surgical pathology uh, then of the tissue that came from the, uh, this procedure uh, was uh, shown here. And uh, there's a uh, mass here that is uh, homogeneous and uh, looking at it has uh, a lot of uh, large cells. Uh, the pathologist said they had plasmablastic differentiation to some extent. And uh, these cells were positive for uh, uh, CD20 and MUM1. And uh, so this uh, was considered to, uh, or diagnosed as most likely a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So here's where his splenectomy uh, was. And uh, you can see that he actually got four units of transfusion during this procedure. Uh, his hemoglobin uh, uh, later returned to about eight and a half, but then uh, even despite discontinuing plasma exchange and discontinuing the, the cyclosporin and the methylprednisolone, his hemoglobin uh, came up on its own. He didn't get any more transfusions after the uh, after the 25th. So that was his last transfusion there. So, uh, and uh, the patient has had a normal uh, hemoglobin and a normal bilirubin since. Actually, in this February, the patient's hemoglobin was 14.7 and the total bilirubin was 0.7. So in this case, what we have is a patient who probably had a warm and a cold autoantibody that were pathologic and probably uh, related to uh, this lymphoma process. The patient later uh, was treated with uh, top uh, chemotherapy for cycles and went into remission. And uh, so the, he had, uh, you know, autoantibodies probably related to this lymphoproliferative disease, uh, but then he coincidentally had a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. And that's sometimes how these are detected is the blood bank finds them but uh, they may, you know, may be obscured uh, by the, uh, the other things that are going on clinically in, the, in a patient, as well as the fact that warm and cold autoantibodies can make um, uh, alloantibodies difficult to detect sometimes. So uh, uh, the story, the, the lessons from delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction uh, is that they're usually an amnestic response. Uh, they're undetected antibodies uh, at the time uh, that we're uh, setting up the blood, uh, uh, but they can rebound following uh, uh, exposure to more blood. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why we like to get a very careful history uh, you know, whether the person has been transfused before because uh, the blood bank can call those other blood banks and say, you know, do you have any history on this person? Because sometimes these antibodies go out of detection and uh, we may not see them. I think it's kind of interesting that both the cases I found uh, had anti-E and anti kid A. That's somewhat of a coincidence because other antibodies could be involved as well, but in these particular cases, it was anti-E and anti-KID-A. And uh, they may present uh, with a positive antibody screen alone. Um, they may, uh, may not be detectable or autoantibodies can obscure their detection. And of course, what we're gonna do going forward is we're gonna provide antigen negative blood. That's the best thing that we can do for these patients.
Now, the case of sickle cell uh, disease is a, a bit different because uh, this is a very feared complication in patients with sickle cell disease, the delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Uh, and it actually is much more common in patients who uh, have sickle cell disease. It uh, is probably about 100 times more common for a, a sickle cell patient uh, to develop uh, a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, up to 7 point, almost 8% of uh, transfusions. And uh, these patients, of course, are uh, often are frequently transfused. They're transfused with blood that's uh, usually from a different ethnic type than they are. And so they are prone to making uh, alloantibodies. And often these alloantibodies are not detected uh, either before the transfusion and even after the transfusion. So that's a very interesting uh, problem that uh, uh, confounds these cases. Uh, but they can present uh, with fever, pain, hemoglobinuria, vasoclusive episode uh, frequently, and uh, they can even get acute chest syndrome. Uh, they have a, a phenomenon called hyperhemolysis where not only are the transfused uh, cells uh, hemolyzed, but also the autologous uh, red blood cells get hemolyzed and it can cause a worsening anemia and uh, reticulocytopenia. They can have multi-organ failure and uh, if they're transfused in this setting it could even make things worse. So uh, these are very tricky cases I think. I, I don't have a lot of experience with them personally but I can tell you that uh, they sound really bad and uh, uh, they do have a, a pretty significant mortality rate, uh, and antib alloantibodies uh, can be difficult to detect in these patients. Uh, there are groups that, uh, you know, based on these ideas, uh, you know, use a different strategy. So uh, a good strategy in general to use is to give these patients leukoreduced blood to reduce the uh, incidence of aluminization, and also uh, to uh, give them matched blood, blood that's especially matched in RH and Cal antigens, which are the most common antibodies that they can make. And uh, uh, then uh, they, uh, because uh, antibodies can be difficult to detect, uh, they use, uh, in these patients, they use uh, a little different strategy, uh, which is uh, they try to determine what a person's risk of uh, making new antibodies is. And they found that these uh, features here, historical antibodies, a history of delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, and a low exposure to blood beforehand, uh, put a person at very significantly elevated risk of having a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Uh, so they'll not only match these persons for um, RH antigens and Cal antigen, but they may also extend the, the uh, uh, matching to the Duffy, Kid, and S antigens as well. And uh, they, uh, because they, ALO antibodies are difficult to detect in these patients. They have a little different strategy of, of detecting a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, which is based on following up the hemoglobin A percent. And you can, uh, they have developed nomograms, uh, especially the, uh, these, uh, the bottom two papers that I have on the slide here. They've developed nomograms that can help uh, you identify if your patient uh, may be at high risk for having an alloantibody. So that's a little about sickle cell disease. This was a, a hike to uh, Grinnell Glacier in uh, Glacier Park with my family, beautiful place. Okay, now I'd like to uh, finally uh, look at a little case vignette uh, uh, involving a patient who had an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction as a way to uh, finish up our presentation here. So uh, this uh, patient was a 58-year-old male 
who received transfusion of red cells during abdominal surgery for carcinoma. Uh, his admission hemoglobin was nine. Uh, he was blood group O and had a negative antibody screen. He received one unit of red cells and uh, became hypotensive and tachycardic and developed oozing shortly after that transfusion. And so uh, the transfusion was immediately stopped and the blood bank was notified. And uh, we received a sample, well, the persons that had this reaction received a sample in the blood bank. And so uh, this is uh, what the typing results looked like. Uh, the patient was originally group O, that was the pre-transfusion here. You can see no reactions with anti-A or anti-B, and whereas the plasma contained anti-A and anti-B. So this was a group O person. Uh, but then in the post-transfusion, there were some uh, anti, there were some A cells detected. And so mixed field is what this MF stands for. Mixed field means that there's two populations of cells detected in there. One of them is agglutinating with anti-A, the other isn't. And so there's probably a mixture of O and A cells in there. And uh, the direct antiglobulin test could be positive, but if all the cells lice, it can actually be negative as it was in this case here. And uh, so uh, they looked back and saw that uh, the group, group O units were compatible, but uh, the medical director notified the surgeon right away that there was a potential hemolytic reaction based on the signs and then also this finding that we're finding A cells now in the person's blood. And uh, so a clerical check, which is a check against the, uh, you know, the blood bag, the uh, computer or the uh, uh, transfusion uh, form, uh, as well as the, um, uh, the transfusion form the, uh, and the patient's uh, blood uh, tag uh, did not match and it showed that the person actually had received a group A blood. Uh, and so uh, it was found that uh, uh, during that uh, final check before the transfusion that uh, the procedure had uh, not been uh, done correctly, uh, had not been checked by two persons. And so ideally what's supposed to happen is that you're supposed to have a transfusionist and another healthcare provider looking at the, at the patient's hospital ID tag, the label on the blood bag, and then they're supposed to make a check in this case, where uh, they're using uh, something called the blood product administration module, and they're supposed to check off that they did all of these things, and both uh, the both of the persons transfusing are supposed to uh, put their initials in there to to verify that they went through all these steps. If these steps are somehow uh, not uh, gone through properly or skipped, then uh, you know, there is the uh, potential for uh, the wrong uh, bag of blood to get to the wrong person and a mistransfusion and a potential acute hemolytic reaction. And uh, the way this would look uh, in the lab, uh, you would have, uh, you know, hemolysis in the plasma, as well as you would see hemoglobin area. Usually these are pretty transient. So if you are uh, you know, suspicious of this, you need to grab the samples right away because it can uh, clear uh, fairly quickly, but it can leave uh, lasting and devastating effects on the patient, of course. This shows the time course of, uh, uh, of several markers uh, in an acute hemolytic reaction. And so within the first hour or two, uh, you'll see uh, a spike in the plasma hemoglobin, the urine hemoglobin, the uh, serum bilirubin, and you'll see a, a, a very early drop off of haptoglobin, which is the major uh, uh, carrier that uh, grabs hemoglobin, free hemoglobin in the system. Uh, it can be consumed very rapidly, uh, as well as in this case, DIC had developed, so they're showing that uh, the fibrinogen and the platelet count uh, dropped uh, uh, pretty much uh, right away as well. 
And what happens with acute hemolytic transfusion reactions is uh, more complicated, uh, but it, in, it usually involves an antibody uh, such as an IgM, or it could be an antibody to a dense antigen, uh, an IgG that is able to fix complement, uh, but complement is fixed. Uh, it, uh, the early uh, components of complement, the anaphylatoxins, uh, you know, have wide ranging effects and they can activate immune cells to produce cytokines such as TNF, interleukin, interleukin 1, 6, and 8, and uh, can cause endothelial damage, uh, endothelial leakage, capillary leak, hypotension, fever, DIC. And then uh, in addition, uh, when complement is activated, uh, then, of course, the membrane attack complex can assemble on the cells and cause lysis of the cells in within the vascular system, and free hemoglobin uh, can, can get into the uh, vascular system. And uh, this can consume nitric oxide. Uh, it can uh, activate inflammatory pathways, and uh, it can uh, cause renal injury. So there's a wide-ranging effects and these can, of course, uh, uh, be quite severe. Uh, although they don't occur every time, but they uh, are definitely, uh, you know, a very feared uh, complication uh, and definitely something that we want to avoid. Um, I've talked a lot about these things here, uh, but uh, I'll, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more in the next couple slides, but uh, uh, in terms of prevention, we'll get to that in a minute, so uh, we're going to talk about that for, on one slide. So in management of acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, uh, we're going to, of course, the moment we uh, that we suspect it, we're going to stop the transfusion and investigate for uh, uh, incompatibility, uh, do the direct antiglobulin test, get the samples, uh, do a peripheral smear. Uh, in terms of treating these patients, uh, you all can probably tell me better uh, than I can tell you, but uh, generally uh, it's three-pronged. You want to uh, try to prevent uh, renal and vascular injury by hydration. Apparently alkalinization is uh, used. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it does. It's said in one place that it's supposed to prevent uh, 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 renal injury and uh, hemoglobin precipitation within the glomeruli and tubules. Um, hypotension uh, is treated, and then you treat. You can treat the uh, DIC with, uh, you know, blood products, platelets, plasma, and crow precipitate. So uh, there are different things that can cause incompatible transfusions. Uh, some of them uh, we do as a uh, choice. So, for example, uh, sometimes uh, we don't have an adequate supply of a certain blood group of platelets. We might have to give out-of-group platelets occasionally. And uh, if a particular platelet has a high titer of an isoagglutinin, like an anti-A, it could potentially sensitize patient cells and cause hemolysis. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, this is a potential problem with out-of-group platelets. Uh, sometimes if a patient comes into the uh, emergency room or, uh, you know, needs emergency surgery before we can uh, complete the workup and they're uh, in dire straits and need blood, we may have to give blood before we've identified the antibodies or uh, it, sometimes they even have antibodies to very high incidence antigens, and it's not possible to find antigen negative blood in time to give to the patient. In those cases, there's a potential for a hemolytic transfusion reaction. And then the other one is, uh, you know, the passenger lymphocyte syndrome. Uh, although that isn't, in my mind, strictly a hemolytic transfusion reaction, it can cause hemolysis when. The, uh, the lymphocytes from a uh, stem cell uh, begin to grow out, they can make anti-A and anti-B and potentially could cause hemolysis. I think we see that less now with uh, the modern 
uh, one, the modern uh, use of immunosuppressive agents, and then also in our blood bank system, uh, we provide blood products that are compatible with both donor and recipient during the transplant interval, during the time when we're hoping for engraftment. And so I think those factors probably reduce the likelihood of seeing this passenger lymphocyte syndrome. But the, the one that's uh, more feared and more uh, a problem in my mind is the unintended administration of incompatible blood. And this can happen in, a, in different ways. I illustrated at the beginning here of the acute hemolytic reaction, a case where the, there was a failure to perform the bedside check correctly. So that's one place. And apparently that actually can account for a significant percentage of these cases. Also, uh, uh, errors can occur in the blood bank. We like to think that they don't, but occasionally that can happen as well. So it's something to always consider. Uh, but the one that I'd like to talk for just another moment or so on is the wrong blood in tube, the, the so-called misidentified sample. And so what is wrong blood in tube? It's when the blood in the uh, tube is not that of the patient. It's, uh, so the label uh, on the tube uh, is not that of the patient, of the actual patient. So how can that happen? Well, there, uh, th this process of putting blood into tubes and putting labels onto tubes is manual and involves human beings and errors can be made. And uh, it, uh, th these tend to be discovered uh, by blood banks when they're doing a ABO type on a repeat sample and they're finding out that the patient's blood type is no longer what what it originally was reported. And that's one of the reasons why blood banks use this second sample collection is to try and of an independently collected sample to try to ensure that we can detect those. Wrong blood in tube uh, occurs about uh, one in 2,500 uh, cases. Uh, this, uh, this has has been done through uh, many hemovigilance studies and uh, uh, been found to be pretty, pretty much like that. It's, uh, it's an intractable problem that uh, still continues to be seen. Uh, the uh, failure to label the tube at the uh, bedside is responsible for most of these uh, events and uh, uh, we recently at NMH did a process to try to uh, uh, identify steps where uh, this was happening. We had a, little, a, few, a few of these cases occur. And so we did a root cause analysis and found out that uh, it uh, boiled down to uh, uh, verifying the patient ID on the hospital wristband comparing the legal name and the medical record number with the pre-printed label and applying that pre-printed label to the collection tube at the bedside. So those were identified as uh, critical steps that uh, could uh, uh, be potentially places uh, where failures occurred. So uh, it's very important to keep in mind uh, uh, the proper labeling techniques. So in summary, uh, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions are not detected at the time of transfusion. They sensitize red, the antibodies sensitize red cells and can cause hemolysis and anemia. Uh, we prescribe antigen negative blood when we recognize that. Sickle cell disease can have uh, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions that uh, can be quite severe and complicated by bystander hemolysis. Uh, there are, are immediate and severe acute hemolytic reactions that can re result from mistransfusion, which is caused by clerical errors. And we need to uh, take great care in patient identification, blood collection, and testing. Okay. Are there any questions? I want to also, by the way, thank uh, all, all my colleagues as well as everyone in the blood bank. 
who uh, helped me to collect all this information, uh, especially Karen Hartman, Robin Betts, Lauren Zalewski, and uh, Emily Piper, who helped me to uh, pull up together some of the slides for this. Any questions? Uh, we can uh, take them by chat or uh, however you want to do it. Can we verbally do it? Sure. Uh, okay, so I, I read an interesting uh, study that, um, a couple days ago. They, um, they're they having uh, these pro kinds of problems with the convalescent serum um, uh, treatment approach to um, um, to COVID-19. And um, I just wanted to know if you guys have uh, had any of these cases and um, what, what you're seeing. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so at our blood bank, uh, Dr. Ramsey told me that, uh, 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 that we took in transfer one patient yesterday who received convalescent plasma. So I have not uh, personally seen uh, that happen yet, uh, but we're just beginning to get underway with that. And uh, uh, I'm hoping that we'll get a lot more of transfusions uh, of convalescent plasma. It sounds like it potentially could be, you know, life-saving for some people. Uh, and we are to treat, uh, you know, the FDA requires that we are to treat uh, these uh, transfusions uh, of uh, convalescent plasma as a regular allo donor, both from the collection angle as well as the administration angle. So they really should be given group specific to the uh, to the recipient. Yeah. So exactly that point. The um, the report was that they were having uh, they were giving group specific uh, uh, transfusions, of course, but they were still having as high as 1% uh, uh, really problematic um, sequelae. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess your procedures might uh, require that they be tested a little bit more carefully than this particular study, but some people thought 1% was, was pretty high. And uh, they also were giving these to very advanced patients, so they still had a, something like 14 or 15% uh, death rate, but they I, I'm not sure that they could avoid it given the uh, characteristics of these patients. Yeah, well, the fact that it's plasma and if it's being given in group, then uh, it really should minimize the risk of a hemolytic reaction. However, uh, with plasma, usually our more, most common reaction is uh, either an allergic reaction or volume overload reaction or sometimes an anaphylactic or you know an, a further manifestation of an allergic reaction. So I'm not sure I, I haven't seen that report. I'd love to see that and see you know what they're finding. I, 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 I did not see that yet. But it's a good question. Um, someone, Anna, I guess, asked, uh, besides sickle cell population, are there others uh, for which we should consider extended antigen typing and how should, how would we request that? Well, uh, I don't think that that's uh, to be uh, quite uh, forward here with you. I don't think it's a, a common practice here, uh, but uh, we definitely could try to accommodate it. Uh, I, uh, others who I think may be in the same general risk of this would be patients with hemoglobinopathy and thalassemia. They may also have some bystander uh, hemolysis problems, I believe. Uh, and uh, so perhaps they would be another population that uh, may benefit from extended antigen matching, although uh, I haven't seen uh, any direct literature on that. That's a good question, though. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Thoughts? <laughs> 
if, if that's all, then thank you very much for your attention and participation. I uh, enjoyed uh, uh, giving this for you, and I hope that uh, you found some parts of it useful for your practice. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lindholm. We really appreciate it.